Gracious Father, loving Lord, speak to us, we ask. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Matthew 6 and verse 24. We begin with a passage that is different from what is in the bulletin. That scripture reading is going to be at the very end of the sermon. But I want to begin with Matthew 6 and verse 24 because it addresses us at the point of our walk with Christ. No, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is that Greek word used for money but can be interchanged with anything that hinders our service to God. You can't really dedicate yourself fully to two individuals, to two things, to God and to the world. Somewhere along the way, something is going to give. You know, as we prepare for the coming of the Lord, we've got to really check our hearts. I've heard of people having heart attacks. And when they were being seen by their heart surgeon or heart, heart doctors, they said that your arteries are so clogged, your veins are becoming hindered by things that have built up through the years. They are no longer allowing the blood to flow to get to the heart. You see, oftentimes what we see many years down the road is a condition that took a while to develop. It didn't happen overnight. No one, you don't hear of heart attacks in a 15-year-old, rare, or in a person that's young. It's often in people that are getting on in years and people that are involved in a certain type of lifestyle or something that they have ignored, thinking that they were an exception to the rule. And so as we get ready for the coming of the Lord, I would strongly recommend that we need to check to see whether or not anything in our lives may be clogging our arteries that the blood of Jesus cannot get to our heart. When the blood of Jesus cannot get to your heart, you are on your way to experience a spiritual heart attack from which very few survive. And that's why this message this morning is so significant. I believe that Jesus is soon to return. All the e external signs are evidence that Jesus is soon to come, but something is clogging our arteries. Something is contending for your heart. And as the scripture says, we need to address it before we realize that the one who does not deserve our affections has stolen our hearts from God. Such is the case this morning. The devil is a demon of opportunity. Timing is very much a part of his schedule. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 12, he knows he has but a short time. You see, there is never a more opportune time to attack the people of God than a few days before they plan to enter the promised land. As you study the life of the Israelites, you discover that a journey that could have taken no more than 11 days became a 40-year nightmare. God never intended. God did not intend for us to be down here this long. But something happened to Israel's heart in the wilderness. Israel's journey went through three phases. The first 40 days was organized at the base of Mount Sinai where they received the commandments of God. The covenant of God was reiterated to them. God began to establish the very platform that he desired for them to stand on in order for that their entrance into the land of Canaan could be successful. But shortly after leaving Mount Sinai, 38 years they wandered in the wilderness, practically disorganized, because they fought against every attempt that God made to get them ready for entrance into the promised land. 
Our story is going to pick up in the context of the last five months before they enter the promised land. On the plain of Moab, when you read the book of Numbers, you've, you discover some beautiful things. You discover that somewhere along the way, God was able to get to many of the hearts of the Israelites. And they were winning one battle after the other after the other. Every nation that came against Israel ended in defeat. The Amalekites and the Amorites, nations that would steal the land of other nations, will eventually lose the possession of that land when Israel came along. And we pick up the story where God is about to remind his people that the only way that we can be continually victorious is if we live our lives God's way. Let's pick up the story. You find Israel had more battles than God intended. Armies great and small were demolished by Israel when the conflict between them and Israel ended. On 28 separate occasions, you read in the Bible this short phrase, Israel defeated. And then the name of the nation is mentioned. You notice in speaking of the Amorites, we read this in Numbers chapter 21, verse 24. Speaking of the Amorites, the Bible says, Israel defeated him with what, friends? With the edge of the sword. Very interesting phrase, the edge of the sword. Why not with the sword? Why not with the blade of the sword, but the edge of the sword? When you study in the Bible, you find that more than 35 occasions, the phrase, the edge of the sword, is spoken of in Scripture when it came to Israelite winning their battles. If you study, you find that the edge of the sword is the point of the tip where all sides of the sword merge together. It is the sharpest part of the sword, the edge of the sword. Let me give you some good news if the Israelites could win their battles with the edge of the sword, what's given me encouragement is God has given us something today that is better than the edge of the sword. And what is it? Hebrews 4 verse 12. For the word of God, say it with me, friends, is what? Quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen, somebody. No power on earth can defeat the all-powerful, undeniable, undefeatable Word of God. No power on earth, no denomination can stand against it. No prelate, whether degree or no degree, can stand against the veracity and the authenticity and power of God's Word. But here's what the context is all about. If the Israelites could win with the edge of the sword... Why are we not winning when we have something sharper than the edge of the sword? Why is there so much defeat in our lives when we have something sharper than any two-edged sword? Not just the edge of the sword. Israel had one sword with one edge. The Bible says the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. So if you had a sword with two edges, the Bible is sharper than that. Come on, say amen, somebody. That's why Satan strives so hard. Lord, help me today. Your pastor pleads with you to come to study the Bible because I know that the victories in my life came when I got serious with God's Word. And I know that the only way you're going to survive what's coming is when you get serious with God's Word. You can't fight the battle without a sword. As a matter of fact, I go farther. You may have on the whole armor of God and still lose the battle because you don't know how to use the sword. You are not proficient with it. And Satan strives to keep us from being proficient with God's Word. Bibles that look brand new that you've owned for years. Pages are still being cracked because you don't pick it up. You don't carry it. What soldier would you send to defend your nation without a weapon? Can you imagine? There are 200,000 troops in the Middle East. None of them has a weapon. They are more... They are more neutered than one soldier on the other side with the weapon. The devil has a lot of weapons. If you don't become proficient with God's Word, you will not survive what's coming. 
Only those, the Bible says there's a, there's a famine coming, not for bread and water, but for the hearing of the word of God. And the word of God that is being ignored today in times of peace and, and prosperity and, ge and general calm will find us looking for our weapons, but nowhere to be found. Amos says it. There's a famine coming, not for bread and water, but for the hearing of the word of God. That's why it's amazing to me. Seventh-day Adventists professing to be followers of God take God's word so lightly. If you're not one of those that take God's word so lightly, ignore my passion. But if God's word has not become the weapon that, of your choice, not your phone, not the Internet, not anything that's digital, let the word of God. You can't fight the devil with a digital sword. you got to fight him with a real one. Okay, I'll take a breath. As soon as Israel left Sinai, where they received the commandments of God, Satan employed every means by which he would seek to prevent them from entering into Canaan. The last five months were the toughest months. Because the nations around them saw how God had finally got into somebody's heart and they were winning, they were winning, they were winning, they were winning, they were winning. And the nations around said, did you see what they did to the Amalekites? Did you see what they did to the Jebusites? Did you see how they plummeted the, the Hiveites and the, and the Parasites? Did you see what they did? And as they got closer to other nations, the nations that were in their path said, this is not how we want to go out. We pick up the story in Numbers chapter 22. And we look together at verse 1. This is right after the King Og was defeated. Next in line was the Moabites. And the Bible says, Then the children of Israel moved and camped in the plains of what? Moab, on the side of the Jordan, across from Jericho. Now Balak the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And he said, are we next? Amen. Continuing in verse 3. And Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. Oh, my goodness. Lord, help me out. Is the enemy afraid of you? Did you hear me today? If the enemy is not afraid of you, then you are no use to the kingdom of light. I want to live a life in such a way that when the devil sees me coming, say, look out for him. He, he's a Bible thumper. Entered the auditorium. Don't, don't mess with him. He knows his Bible. I've had people say, no, we don't want to have another Bible study with you. I was having studies with about 12 Jehovah's Witnesses years ago, and I told the young lady who set it up because they wouldn't listen to me. So I said, okay, so I was not a pastor. I was not even an elder. I was not even a deacon. I was just a church member. And she was at my wife's job, and she was getting Bible studies. My wife was always a missionary, and she said, this young lady just began studying with the Jehovah's Witnesses. And my wife said, why don't you study with us? And she says, well, I have to study with them. So my wife said, Angie said, why don't you invite my husband and me to come to the Bible study? And they met, they set it up, and we went. And we were sitting in a room with all these Jehovah's Witnesses all around. I'm being very candid today. And the leader of the group said, we can only use the Bible. I said, that's all I have with me. Because he had done his homework. He knew that we had the writings of Ellen Wyatt. He thought I was going to bring her word. See, the word of God is powerful. God has never given you the writings of Ellen White to convert anybody. You do it by God's word, the authority that is unmovable. Praise God for inspiration behind the curtain, but I brought just my Bible. When he got in a pickle, he called for his other leaders to, oh, go to the back room and get such and such a book. He called for another book, one of the Watchtower books. I said, ah, 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 ah. Bible only. Remember that. And when the study was over, they were sweating because he was sweating. He made the mistake of surrounding himself, himself with people that didn't know their Bibles either. They were quoting partials, partial points of Scripture 
Like the Jehovah's Witnesses that walked up to my door one Sunday morning when I was dressed to go play basketball. Had my black shorts and my yellow shirt with my basketball. He was in a beautiful suit. Two young ladies he was training. He was going to show them how to deal with this young man. But I knew my Bible. I was about 19 years old. And he rang my doorbell. He came to the wrong house on the right day. <laughs> and he wanted to talk to me about the commandments being done away with. I said, read Deuteronomy 5, verse 22. I didn't have a Bible. I said, let me use your Bible. Read Deuteronomy 5, verse 22. The Bible says, the Lord wrote the commandments on two tablets of stone. And I said, what does this say there? You said the commandments and the ceremonial law are the same. What does this say at the end of that passage? He added nothing more. How much more did he add? Nothing more. How much more did he add? Nothing more. So they're not the same. Those two young ladies walked away and left him there. I wouldn't let him go. Don't mess with somebody who has been molded by God's word. If people, and you know what they did? They skipped my house from that point on. <laughs> Amen. Skip my house. But no, when you ring my doorbell, this house knows how to use God's word. That's where you have to be in these last days. The, the Moab was sick. But the fact of the matter is Israel was only powerful as they were faithful. God does not empower those that are not faithful. When you read verses 4, I'm not going to read that today. But Balak, the king of Moab, was afraid that his kingdom was next to be destroyed. So he looked for someone that would be willing to curse Israel for him. You know what's sad to me is the devil can always find someone willing to do his bidding. Even in the church. <laughs> Weed and tear. He can always find somebody that's willing to be hired for a satanic purpose. The Bible says in, Deut in Numbers chapter 22, verse 5 and 6, found a man, a man who used to be faithful, but he had apostatized. And the devil says, let's look for somebody who no longer walks with God the way they should, but his influence is powerful. I'm nervous when people are influential because if you're influential and you don't walk with God, the devil wants to put you on his payroll. Yes. Verse 5, then he sent messengers, that is Balak sent messengers from the Moabites. He sent them to Balaam, the son of Beor at Pithor, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people to call him. Boy, when the devil puts you on his phone list to call him, saying, Look, a people has come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth and are setting where? <laughs> they right next door. He's nervous because some godly people moved in next door. Verse 6, Therefore, please, when the devil starts asking you to do something for him, please come at once. Curse this people for me, for they are, say it together, too mighty for me. That ought to be said about us. Come on. Amen. Don't go down there and mess with those folks. They know their Bibles. You want to mess with somebody? Go to that church or that church. Don't go down there. And he goes on to say as to Balaam, perhaps... I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. That's a lie. Amen. Let me make a point. God will bless Bob if Bob is faithful. Amen. But Bob does not have the power to reverse God's blessing. God. Moab thought they, they, they had sought sorcery just like Pharaoh. Pharaoh turned to sorcery to try to keep the Israelites bound in Egypt. Moab, a, a, um, um, Balak, the king of Moab, he thought, we've heard that everybody that Balaam prays for is either blessed or cursed. He must have some sorcery powers. He must be a magician somewhere. This is the guy we need. But what he failed to realize is Balaam was soon to find out, like Pharaoh found out, that when God blesses you, nobody can curse you. He made this promise to Israel a long time ago. He told Abraham, he says, 
Genesis 12 and verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Amen. Translated, God will use you as a channel of blessing, but when you decide to change the channel, God has another channel to bless his children. Balaam had influence. His name was great, but he could not reverse God's plan. God says, if you bless Israel, I'm going to bless you. If you curse Israel, I'm going to curse you. And Balaam was about to go down the path to be cursed by God. And he failed to realize that disobedience always has a price. Look at Numbers chapter 22, verse 7. So the elders of Moab, the elders of Moab, and the elders of Midian departed with a, what kind of fee? Diviner's fee in their hand. Disobedience always has a price. And they came to Balaam and spoke to him the words of Balak. <laughs> they said, come on, how much is it going to be? So they reached in their little shallow pockets and pulled out piddly, piddly, piddly money. And Balaam, who now had apostatized but claimed to be still a, a, a faithful messenger of God, he was struggling with covetousness. Yes. Let me make a point. If you are covetous, the devil's got a price for you. So he came. How much would it cost you? Don't ever forget the wages of sin. The wages of sin. There's always a wage to sin. And when his heart was divided, when our hearts are divided, sin will deceive you into thinking that God's word is negotiable. What's happening today in the Christian world is leaders are putting a question mark where God's word has a period. You can't curse them. Balaam was, well, can I curse them? No, you can't curse them. He knew. Balaam knew. Balaam knew the answer before he was even asked the question, can you do this for us? Can you do us a favor? The Moabites and the Midianites need your help. We know you work for God, but maybe on this occasion we could pay you to do a job for us just for a short time. Let me make another point. Watch out when you create an alliance with somebody who doesn't stand for the truth. Did you hear what I said? That's happening today. A lot of our churches bringing in folk to preach and to teach and do all this kind of stuff to get us all excited about what they have when they would not stand on God's word. Remember a preacher came to one of our conventions. He was invited. I surely didn't invite him. But I remember being at one of our constituency meetings in Southern California, the, the, the union constituency, and the preacher that was preaching was a Baptist man he was, so much of what he said was not scriptural, and I kept writing them down. I got to the point where I got so sick of his non-scriptural approach, Dr. So-and-so. When you have a Ph.D., that means absolutely nothing. If you're not led by God's word, Ph.D. means permanent head damage. <laughs> but if you're following God, Ph.D. means praise him daily. Amen. Amen. He had permanent head damage, but his degree preceded him. So he is talking to all these Adventist preachers. I got sick of that. I went out into the foyer, and I said, who was foolish enough to invite? I, I was going to blow up in the auditorium. I had to get out. Who was foolish enough to invite this man to talk to us? He doesn't know, he doesn't know his Bible. I don't care about his degree. And one of, the other, one of the other people in the union said, now this is crazy. I, I just so happened to be verbal in the foyer with the man who invited him just two steps away from me. And uh, I, didn't know, I, didn't know he, I didn't know who it was, but God lined that up. Because I'm sure that God worked on his heart, but he ignored it. So God brought me out there. Who was foolish enough to invite? Who? And one of the other guys in the conference said, he did. <laughs> I still have it to this very day in my, in my binder, in, my, in the shed, all these points, you're not, you don't have a soul, you are a soul. You don't cease to exist. You continue existing other places. He was lying all over the place. That's what happens. When your heart is divided, sin will deceive you into thinking that God's word is negotiable. Balaam had apostatized. He knew the answer before he went to God. 
Don't ever go to God thinking that somehow conditions have changed for you. Thou shall not applies to every one of us. So look what he did. They came and negotiated with him. And instead of saying, you need to go back home because I serve the true God, look what Balaam said. And he said to them, lodge here tonight and I will bring back word to you. As the Lord speaks to me, God already spoke to him. So the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam. He gave them a comfortable room for them, gave them some veggie links, some, some, uh, some postum, you know, some whole wheat bread, feeding his enemies, talking to God, saying, now, God, this is, this, is a serious, this is a serious contract. I mean, this could really help me with my bills. You know, somebody just won $1.2 billion in the lottery. I bet you a lot of Adventists played that. Because there's some folk, a lady called me once from the Philippines. She said, God refused to bless me. I said, what do you mean? She said, Pastor, I've been trying to win the lottery, and I just can't win it. I said, God's not intending for you to win the lottery that way. She said, but if I win it, I could help the church. I said, you need to help the church by being faithful. God will bless his people, but don't compromise his word and expect God to bless you. So he said, let me see what God has to say about it. Balaam was in essence saying, tonight I'll talk to God to see if he would give me permission. Balaam was open to the bribe and closed to the word of God. And you know what? The issue is not the money. The issue was his heart. The Bible doesn't say there's a problem with the money. Notice what Paul writes in, to his protege Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, together, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith, left the church for money, in their greediness, and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Some people get a call from some secular uh, 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 book agent that wants to take their talents and give them a lot of money. And I can go down the list and go name after name after name of young people that had great skills and abilities to sing in our church that went out into the world and are making probably hundreds of thousands, maybe millions. The sad part of it is, though, is when they come back, we glorify them as though they found something better than what we have. So-and-so is here tonight with two earrings on. Man in the world, joking on the Sabbath in God's house. And we're... Don't ever glorify people that are in apostasy because money will not get us to the kingdom when we live against God's will. Knowing that Balaam was in trouble, knowing that Balaam was in trouble, God said, I need to talk to you, Balaam. So God stepped in. Look at this, Numbers 22, verse 9. What a story. And God came to Balaam and said, who are these men with you? God was not asking for names. God knew exactly who these men were. So God didn't say, could you give me a list of the names of the people with you? He was saying, you are, in, you, are, you, are, you are hanging out with the wrong crowd. Watch out if you're hanging around people that don't live like you for the wrong reason. Why do I say for the wrong reason? Jesus hung around publicans, tax collectors, harlots, and sinners, not to become like them, but for them to know him. Amen. Some people work at work and they compromise. Because, you know, everybody else is having a beer, so I'll just drink a beer because everybody else is having a beer. You know, and you got to be a Christian when the situation is not favorable. you got to stand for what's right when nobody else wants to do it. And you have to live your life in such a way, not bombastic and judgmental and condemning, but let your light shine so that people, when they know where to go, they know you're the person they can go to. God was saying to Balaam, you got to watch out. You know, Paul the Apostle wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Evil company, what do they do? Corrupts good habits. So when God asked him, who are you hanging out with? He said, you are heading down the wrong path. These Midianites and these Moabites are not the people you need to be associated with. As a fact, matter of fact, we got to get rid of them for you to make it into Canaan. But instead of Balaam understanding the reason, 
behind God's question. <laughs> Balaam gives God information. What a, how dumb can he get? Look at what he said. Instead of saying, okay, Lord, I, I get it. I get it. I'm hanging with the wrong people. Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, as though, as though God did not know. King of Moab has sent to me saying, look, a people has come out of Egypt and they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps Israel shall be able to overthrow them and drive. I shall, perhaps I shall be able to overthrow them and drive them out. Did God know that? Of course God knew. God heard that conversation. That's why he said to Balaam, who are these folk you're hanging out with? How did you let them spend the night in your house under these circumstances? See, when God asks where you're going, he's not asking for location. He's not asking for directions. He does not want your GPS coordinates. He's alerting you that you're going in the wrong direction. When God asks what are you doing, he's not asking for a description. He's warning us of the consequences of our next action, our next decision. And believe me, I'm old enough to recognize that I've made some bad choices, but praise God, he said to me, who are these folk you're hanging out with? What are you doing? When God pulls your coattail, get right with God. So since Balaam was dumb, becoming dumber, God had to clarify himself. Look at verse 12 in Numbers 22. And God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people. Here's the reason why. For they are, say it, friends, blessed. But Balaam had practiced covetousness so long that somewhere in his dark, crooked mind, he still believed that he could pull off the contract, do a hit job for the Midianites and the Moabites, and still maintain God's favor. So instead of saying to them, you need to go home because this ain't going to work, look at what he said, his partial response. Watch out when people tell the partial truth because a partial truth is a total lie. Here it is, verse 13. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, go back to your land for the Lord has refused to give me permission to go with you. I, I would go, but I just didn't get permission. Even in that, he didn't tell the whole truth. He said, the Lord would not let me go with you, but he didn't say the Lord told me, I cannot go with you, and I cannot curse these people. So he left the door open. When you leave the door open to the devil, he will up the ante. <laughs> Lord, help us. He will up the ante. Instead of, Balaam, instead of Balaam saying, I can't do it, I'm not cursing them, God told me not to go with you, get out of my house, get your stuff, get your suitcases, get in your car and hightail it out of here. He said, God just, won't let me, God just won't let me go with you. In other words, is there another way we could do this without me going with you? Is there another way we can pull this off? Because I really do need that money. Is there another way, Curtis, we can make this happen? Because I can't do it by going with you, but maybe we could do it by the Internet. When God's word does not give permission, it is because God sees the end before we see the beginning. You know, I think today more people will choose God if God would agree with their course. More people will join the church if they could join the church as they are on their terms. When I'm preparing people for baptism and there's something that come up, they say, well, I don't want to do that. I don't fight with them. I explain what the scriptures say, and I said, do you want to follow God and his word? If they say no, hey, that's on them. My heart is pained when people turn away, but I cannot modify God's requirements for anybody because they apply to me also. I'll keep praying for them, God to break their will, but God will never break a will unless you submit it to him. 
So Balaam left the door open because he figured, got to be a way. So the Moabite king kept pushing because Balaam did not close the door. You see, friends, when we don't say no to Satan, he will increase his bribe. He'll send somebody more beautiful, more powerful, with more money, with more influence. He'll figure you out and put the package together. This time you'll say, yo, hey, hey, hey. I never, go, I never thought it was get like this. Now, Lord, did you see who just walked in? This guy's got money. And a couple million, he ain't going to miss. So could you help me get it? And the devil knew that. Look at verse 15. Then Balak again sent princes more numerous and more honorable than they. This is where Balaam heard when the doorbell rang and he saw people in suits stepping out of Mercedes and Range Rovers. Nothing wrong with those vehicles. But those folk walked up to the door. Everything was in place, tight, and they all had silver briefcases. He imagined, that's for me. And they rang the doorbell. Is this the residence of Balaam, the prophet of God? Hey, <laughs> that's me, that's me. All the while, he's not looking at me. He's looking down at the briefcase. That's me. Come on in. And they all came in, six of them, put their briefcases down on the table. And he saw that silver briefcase. He said, man, last guys came with a checkbook. These guys got briefcases. Wonder how much is in that. Could you see the picture? The problem with Balaam was... He was able to be flattered. Flattery will get you somewhere, but you won't like where it gets you. Princes, ambassadors, more honorable, more numerous. Here's Balaam's problem. John brings it out in John 12, verse 43. Jesus said, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Watch out when people praise you for something that belongs to God. You sing and God is somebody's blessed, say, praise God. Give God the glory. But some people hear, sing a song and they sound so good and they, they do it so well, they think, hmm, I wonder how much money I can make in the secular industry. I've had people say, you know, if I could just get this contract, I'll get all this money and I'll be able to help ministries in our church. I'll be able to, you know what, what you fail to realize is when the devil put the handcuffs on you, he ain't giving you the key. When that money got you hooked, when you were handcuffed by that fame and that fortune, the devil say, uh-uh, I got the key. And you are not going anywhere. And it's not that God didn't warn you. It's that you ignored God's warning. The king of the Moabites kept appealing to Balaam. Look at verse 17. And this is where it got really sticky. For I will certainly honor you how? Greatly. And this is where the devil catches some of us. And I will do whatever you say to me. How appealing is that? Therefore, please come, curse this people for me. The devil did that to Jesus. He said, see all the kingdoms of the world and their glory? I'll give it all to you. You want it all? I'll give it to you. But don't forget in the small print where many of us just click, I agree to terms and conditions. The terms and conditions mean your soul is mine. You will join me in the fires of destruction. It may seem joyful for the present, but I want to tell you when you, hear, when you feel the heat and it's not over there but it's right on you, you'll realize that really the price wasn't worth it. I'd rather be, and I'm going to say this, God does not, let me just put this in the right context. Some people think God has to keep you poor for you to be saved. That's not scriptural. Many wealthy, many successful, many people with millions and billions have a great relationship with God, but God knows who can handle it and who cannot handle it. Amen. He's not going to give you something that will end up in your destruction. But when you pursue something that God does not have for you, you will fall into the trap where the devil will say to you, whatever you say to me, I will give it to you. And you will set the price, and then you'll betray God. 
You see the problem here, Balaam would not betray God for a small price. So the devil says, let's increase the price. And let me say it again, whatever the price, the wages of sin is still death. And so when you read verses 18 and 19, Balaam says, no matter how much you give me, this is amazing, no matter how much you give me, I will not change my mind. But this is crazy. But if you stay the night, I'll ask God again. Did you get what I just said? Balaam said to them, I don't care what you give me. I will not curse these people. But stay overnight. Let me see what God says. He didn't want them to take that ba money back home. He didn't want to take that money back home. So when you read verse 20, you do this yourself. So God now seeing that Balaam is in danger and Balaam is leaning more against God than for God, the Lord sets a condition. He says to him, if they say to you, go with them, go with them. You know what that means? Come on, watch this. You know what that means? If you don't want to stay because that's what God prefers, God say, well, you want to go? Go. You want to go? Go. You want to leave the church? Go. You want to go, to the, you want to go and live that life? Go. That's where your heart is, Balaam? Go. But here were the conditions. I want you to follow me now. Don't fall asleep on me. Don't know how you can, but don't fall asleep on me. When your heart is not satisfied with God, he will give you, as Leon Brown said in our Sabbath school this morning, there comes a point where God will accept your choices. Amen. Yeah. If you don't want to serve him, serve whomever you want. If you don't want truth, I'll send you a strong delusion. That's what you want. If you don't want manna, I'll send you quail because that's what you want. Some of us think that God will say no, 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 no. He'll say, oh, that's what you want, Curtis? Go, go. But here's the problem. Balaam is so anxious to go, he doesn't even wait for the invitation. Here's what he does. Look at verse 21. He doesn't even wait for the invitation. He was, God said, wait for them to say, go with us. He doesn't even wait because he's greedy. Verse 21 of Numbers 22. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes to Moab. It takes a while to get to destruction, but you'll eventually get there. I don't know what was going on in his mind. I knew that, I know, that, I got to think this way. I knew that somehow in his mind, he was probably saying, Ricky, I don't know if I should be doing this. But I'm going to come back with those briefcases. And then I'll ask for forgiveness. I'll be forgiven and wealthy. Some people think that way. I was listening to KGO Radio one day to a, to a radio announcer who used to be a former Catholic priest, and he said, it's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. Process that. Don't ask for permission. Just ask for forgiveness. Do what you want to do and just ask for forgiveness. Why did the Lord say to Balaam what he did? David the psalmist talks about this condition in Psalm 81, verse 11 and 12. My people would not heed my voice. How do you feel about God's voice today when the word of God speaks directly to you? And Israel would have none of me. So I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. That's what happens to so many people. And they make it appear as though when they leave the church that somehow we are in trouble because we stayed. Let me say something, brother. If you want to leave, leave. I'm going to be here when Jesus comes. Anybody else? When that door on the ark or the, when, that door, that, when that door in the New Jerusalem opens, if I'm number 77 million, I'm going in. People will try to get you out, and they'll make you feel bad because you stayed. Oh, you believe in this, you believe in that. Yeah, I believe in what God's word says. I'm going to be here. Go ahead and get your fame and fortune. And you know what's amazing? Even wealthy people die. Even famous people die. Tony Bennett just died. I don't know his relationship with God. I can't judge that man. But here's the point. 13 Grammys cannot win you entrance into the kingdom. As Marshall Kelly sang that song, I dreamed that the great judgment morning had dawned and the trumpet had blown. 
I dreamed that the nations had gathered to judgment before that white throne. From the throne came a bright shining angel that stood on the land and the sea and swore with his hands raised to heaven. The time was no longer to be. And he said, the rich man was there, but his money had melted and vanished away. The pauper who stood in the judgment, his debt was too heavy to pay. To pay. The great man was there, but his greatness, when death came, was left far behind. And the angel that opened his record, not a trace of his greatness could find. Watch out when you serve God for reasons that are not your own. Listen to me today. Don't let the devil put you to sleep. Some of you are in a battle right now. Don't fall asleep on this message. When God rejects your path, there are times that he will not prevent your path. He will allow us to follow the dictates and desires of our own hearts. That's why when we do that, we look back with regret. Proverbs 13 verse 15 says what? Together? The way of the transgressor is hard. When they're leaving, they think, I've, I've finally found the way, but the Bible keeps speaking. Proverbs 14 verse 12. There is a way that what? Seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. People think they find the way, but Jesus says, I am the way. The way, the only way. That's it. While Balaam is on his way, his way, God came after him. Now, God came after Balaam not to prevent Balaam from his own choices because Balaam had already been receiving the results of his own choices. He had already apostatized. But why did God come after Balaam? Why did God come against him? Because God did not want Balaam to think or even communicate to the Moabites and to, Midi and to the Midianites. Watch this. This is powerful. God said, don't go with him. So Balaam shows up. And what do you think the Midianites and the, and the Moabites are going to think? Oh, God let you come. So the Lord came to Balaam so that if he got to Moab and the Midianites were there too, they won't be able to say, God gave you permission to come. We're so thankful that God is working with us too. It would have been a mark against God because it would appear as though God opened the door for him to go. So God came against Balaam. Look at Numbers 22, 22. It's a story that you should go home and read. It is powerful. Then God's anger was aroused because he went. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way. As what, friends? As an adversary against him. And he was riding on his donkey. And his two servants were with him. This is a... It, this is where it goes from sublime to ridiculous. It's an amazing story. You see, we call animals dumb, but sometimes dumb animals are smarter than dumber Christians. I should have called the sermon Dumb and Dumber. Because in verse 23, the donkey sees the Lord and runs into the field, and Balaam starts Whipping the donkey. And the angel, why are you hitting the donkey? And the, donkey's, and the donkey starts talking to Balaam. And he ha what's worse is he's starting to have a conversation with his donkey. That's how far the devil takes you. You start talking to animals, and they start talking back. <laughs> then the, the donkey crushes Balaam's foot. Balaam hits the donkey again. He's doing all this because this is powerful. The, the dumb animal sees divinity whereas a prophet of God cannot see it. The donkey sees the Lord and lies down under Balaam, and third, he hit the donkey again. <laughs> what a story. So after three mysterious encounters, talking to a donkey, you got your foot crush, and your donkey said, I'm not going any farther. It is amazing that dumb animals got on the ark and intellectual men were killed in the flood. Dumb animals. We call them dumb. They ain't dumb. You notice when birds fly away, you know something's coming. When deer start running, we know something's coming. They can be receptive to the movements that we are not even aware of. While all these birds are flying in that direction, you better find out what's coming on the weather 
Because they know something you, that you have yet to find out. God communicates with his creation in a way that he desires to communicate with us. But after three mysterious encounters, it should have dawned on a man with some brains that this is not normal. This is not a coincidence. And some of you have heard this phrase before that you think is in the Bible. You've heard the phrase before, God moves in what? Mysterious, Mysterious ways. That's not in Scripture. We always say that. That's not in Scripture. It's not, not a, you can't find that Scripture. A man by the name of William Cowper in the 1700s wrote, God moves in a mysterious way. And God does. So what was God doing here? You see, sometimes our plans, like the donkey, veer us off course because God is trying to warn us. Sometimes God's plans will allow us to get injured in a minor way so that that injury can prevent a major evil. Sometimes God will cause our engine to die to preserve our lives. Sometimes God will keep the plane on the ground to save us from certain death. Because I believe the only thing worse then being on your way to destruction is getting there. And the story just takes a turn that's just amazing to me. Balaam having a conversation with a donkey, and it never dawned on this idiot that the donkey is smarter than he is. I've had conversations with animals before, but you know what? They never talk back. I told my German shepherd one day I'm running away. He never said, I'm going to miss you. <laughs> he just looked at me like, do you have any food? <laughs> when an animal starts talking to you, you better get on your knees. Fast. Some Christians need those parrots that talk. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. And then some of you might just put a covering over their cage to shut them up. You see, this is a powerful story. When Balaam's eyes are opened, when Balaam's eyes are finally opened, you read the rest of the story when you get home. When Balaam's eyes are finally opened, he realized he was resisting God. Balaam finally saw that no one can blame him for his troubles but himself. You know, what's sad about the story is true about so many people. They end up where they are, and they refuse, to retake, they refuse to take responsibility for their own actions that got them there. The biggest issue today is that people end up where they are, and they'll blame everybody else who may have had a part in the crime or a part in the activity that is against God's will, but what would they do? Never take personal responsibility for where they are. So the question I end with today is, what, are the, what is the evidence? What is the evidence that you are torn between two gods? That you are the man with two gods? Here's my first observation. God allowed Balaam to follow his own course because he was determined. Hear me carefully. When we are determined to follow our own course, no matter what God says, we are a man with two gods, torn between one or the other. Secondly, Balaam made his own decisions, but he sought God's approval. Friends, if God's word does not support it, don't ask for God to support it. When we make sinful decisions and claim divine approval, we are being torn between two gods. And don't forget this, because God allows it doesn't mean God sanctions it. He'll, get, he'll send you your quail because that's what you want. That's what you want, that's what God will send. You, you get the strong delusion and say you got lost because of darkness, that's what you wanted. You love darkness rather than light, that's what God sends you. God will not hinder us. Some point, thank you, Leon, 
One day God will get to the place where he accepts your choices. I'm not going to soon forget that. Third reason, Balaam's desires and inclinations were more important than God's word. If you don't read God's word, you'll never know whether or not your desire and your inclination is in harmony with God's word. I'm going to invite the praise team to come out. When our desires and inclinations are more important than God's word, we are torn between two gods. Carnal desire will be precedent over scriptural deportment. Worldly inclination and desire will replace biblical instruction. Don't insist on your desires and inclinations when they're out of harmony with God's word. The fourth observation, Balaam sought Balaam spoke as though God did not choose him, but the fact of the matter is he was a prophet of God. He spoke as though God did not call him to a high calling. Today there are many called to lead, but they prefer their own way instead. You may be a preacher listening to this. You may be a part of another denomination. Let me make a point. If you say, I know what God's word says, but you are torn between two gods. If you say, I know what the scriptures say about this and that, but I prefer this and that, you are torn between two gods. Compromised preachers, God's word forbids it. But if you prefer what God's word forbids, you are the man with two gods. And finally, and this is a sad reality what darkness does to you, Balaam prayed for answers when he already knew the answer. He prayed for permission when he already knew what God's word had said. When we pray, hoping that we can get a different answer than God's word prescribes, we are torn between two gods. Numbers 22, verse 32. Why did the angel stand up against him? Here's what the Bible says. I have come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. How's your path today? Is it reckless? The world may be calling you. It may be upping the ante, but it's a reckless path when it's not in harmony with God's will. So here we have an obedient donkey and a rebellious prophet. A donkey that sits and a prophet that refuses to take a stand. A donkey that stops when man says go and a man that goes when God says stop. Dumb and dumber. At the border of the promised land, Balaam was torn between two gods. Today, I must ask you the question, are you torn between two gods? Is there something pulling you that seems appealing that makes God's requirements seem to be old and out of date and unpopular and not with it and, and out of context with what society decides today? You see, friends, when the two gods are pulling our hearts, we've got to do like Joshua says, as for me and my house, say it with me, we will serve the Lord. There's a better kingdom coming. What do you say? It's better than what's down here. My prayer has been in my life, and God has answered that, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. And I want to tell you, when you ask God to show you the condition of your spiritual arteries and your heart, he'll do it. But some of us today are on the border of a spiritual heart attack. And here's how I end. And this is all God requires of us. One of your gods will disappear and only God will remain if you follow the word of God. Can we end by standing and reading this together? Let us all stand. And I want you to read this together because this should be the only declaration. When we want the Savior to lead us, this should be our only declaration. Together, here it is. Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God and walk in all his ways and to love him to serve the Lord your God with what? All your heart and with all your soul. Amen, somebody? Father in heaven, 
Don't let our hearts deceive us and our minds betray us. Don't allow our choices to mislead us in our decisions to deny us the very blessings that you have prepared for us. We are on the borders of the promised land and the enemy is examining the frailties in us. Do we want to be famous, well-known, popular, liked, praised, regarded, rewarded, or do we want to be faithful? Father, faithfulness is not the bottom of the pole, but it's the top of the list. It is the only thing that will get us out of this planet into your limitless world, your space where no man has boldly gone before. That's what you have in store for those who are faithful. Help us not to be a Balaam in heart, in life, in prayer, in decisions, in compromise, in covetousness. But help us to lay ourselves on that altar of sacrifice and you'll make the difference in our hearts. So Father, we pray that you will lead us and we will be willing to follow. Root out the gods that challenge us, but may our hearts be willing to surrender them to you, that when the day is over and it's all said and done, there's only one God on the throne of our heart, and his name is Jesus. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people said, Amen and Amen.